And I want to minister tonight on the three avenues that release the anointing of God on our life. The three keys in the, in the Word of God mentioned in Scripture that bring the anointing, and we need the anointing on our lives. I've been teaching on the anointing here for probably a while, but I've been waiting to really teach on what does God use to release it on your life? Now, let me, let, me, let me tell you something. The anointing isn't just for feeling good. The anointing is for vision in the spirit, for revelation truth. The anointing brings liberty to captivity. The anointing gives wisdom for life. The anointing gives power over demons. The anointing releases us from disease in our own body. Once that anointing begins to intensify, there'll be no place for sickness in your body. You have to understand that the anointing of God is greater than electricity. You know, you see these lamps with all the light coming through. It's called what? Electricity. But we don't understand how it works. Well, neither do we understand how the anointing works. All we know is, here's certain laws. Here are certain things you have to do for the light to shine. The power of God is, is, is so much greater. You know, you touch a live wire, it'll knock you out. Think about the power of God, why people fall. We're dealing with greater power than electricity. And a little power knocks you out, think a little more will kill you. The power of God also will kill it will kill if we are living in sin. There's a place where the power of God becomes an enemy. You gotta be careful how you're living. Remember that same power destroyed many Israelites. The fire of God came and literally destroyed many of them. That same fire is the anointing. The same anointing that came as fire on the 120. That same fire destroyed people in the Old Testament. That same fire came upon the enemies of God and destroyed them in the days of Elijah the prophet. Who said, if I be a man of God, let fire come from heaven. The same fire that destroyed is the same power that empowered in the upper room. The anointing of God is greater than you and I can ever explain. The anointing of God gives our eyes vision. God said, open your eyes, anoint your eyes that you might see. Anoint your ears that you might hear. Think about oil bringing healing to people's bodies. Symbolic of the anointing. Releasing the anointing. You know, people today have to go through a lot to get uh, help. Or cure, there's no such thing really right now as cure from cancer or most diseases. They can't cure them anyways. They, they just give you medicine to help you live with them. But think about all that you have had to go through and others have to go through to get help medically. People have to do all kinds of things. Go to the doctor and take the pill on time and go for tests. And if you have cancer, you go for this and you go for that. Think all that it does to your body, destroying it. Yet a touch of oil will do way more than all those machines. And all the medicine you can take. Just a little oil brings the power of God and actually fixes the physical realm. That's power. That's greater power than those machines in hospitals and everything else around that people use to get help physically. You know, today, laser can do this and this new technology can do that in moving paint from your leg or this or that, and they use all kinds of new technologies. That's cheap stuff. The anointing of God is greater than any of that. It's an invisible power available to every believer. 
not only does it change you spiritually, not only does it heal you emotionally, that anointing can heal you physically, literally can heal you physically. Imagine that people, and this has happened, people have grown physical, physical parts grown under the anointing. During the Jeffrey Brothers ministry, arms grew in meetings. The anointing gave people arms, bones, and flesh, and skin. Medical science can't do that yet. But the anointing has done it, or people have received fresh, brand new teeth in their mouth. The anointing can give you teeth better than a dentist, trust me. That will last the rest of your life. The anointing of God, I saw the anointing of God heal a little girl in Louisiana. It shook up the whole church. Here sat this little child with a massive head the size of a massive pumpkin and a small body. She, this girl, if you had seen her, every part of you would have been shaken. I walk over, I see this little girl on a wheelchair with this massive, and I want to emphasize massive head. Huge eyes. Not like this, like that. And a humongous, I, 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 I know some of you won't believe this, but the head was about this, this big. Round. Stuck on a little body. You wonder how that body was able to function. And I laid hands on that girl, and I asked God to send his power. And then I spoke a word, and I said, August of, and this was like April, I said, August, gave her the date, I said, that girl will be normal. That girl not only was normal, she came to my crusades and sang. Wow. We have it on, we have it on film. She would come to the crusades and sing and show pictures of before and after. The anointing of God, so powerful, it shrunk her head and her body became normal. Full size, with a beautiful voice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've seen the anointing at work. I've seen the anointing take a tumor off a lady in Madras, India, now Chennai, and the anointing literally like a knife cut it off and it fell on the platform a massive cancerous tumor came off her body the anointing of God did that not a surgeon's knife and no need for a knife or a doctor that thing just fell and no scars left behind that's the anointing somebody say hallelujah I can keep going all night and all day tomorrow and all year to tell you about these miracles my eyes have seen. The anointing is awesome power. Say awesome power. Awesome power. And it's all mine. Say that. It's all mine. Say it again. It's all mine. It's all mine. Lift your hands. Say it again. It's all, mine. it's all mine. Now you have to know how it comes. So. That anointing is so powerful. Once it intensifies, no different than electricity. Once it intensifies, it can raise dead bodies. Back from the dead. Working through dead bones, may I add. Needing a channel. The anointing needs a channel. The anointing cannot come without a wire. All you are is a wire. Think about the electricity. needs a wire to flow. Now, God Almighty wants you to be that wire, that channel, that hose. I said to the Lord years ago, I said, what's my job in the kingdom? He said, you are my hose. That's all you are is my hose. I said, Lord, even the hose sometimes needs some water. <laughs> even the hose needs to get wet sometimes. But we are simply a channel. We are a hose. We are wire. God's instrument that the power can flow through us. And sometimes that power flowed through me so strong, I thought my body would stop. Dear God, I'll never forget. 
dear Mrs. Roberts in Africa, she said, how is it possible that a human body can contain all that power? I said, I don't know, dear Nelly. So I just feel it going through me. I literally feel, sometimes I feel vibrations going through me. No different than electricity. Sometimes when I've been, I've, I've held my hair dryer, you know, if my hands are wet, I can feel the, the shock. So I, you've got to make sure your hands are dry so you don't get electrocuted. You literally feel something go through you, you wish with your, holding your hair dryer. Dear God, that anointing is stronger than any electricity. There's been times I felt like my skin was about to blow off. That anointing is so powerful, it can raise the dead. And that anointing is so powerful. Now you hear this. That anointing is so powerful, and I believe we're going to see it again. It can keep you healthy for the rest of your life. It was the anointing. On Moses was so strong, it says his eye was not dim. Nor his natural force weakened. When he died, he was in total perfect health. 120 years young. Caleb said, he said, I was young when the Lord sent me. And here I am, 80 years old. He said, give me that mountain. He said, I am just as healthy today as I was when the Lord sent me into the promised land. What is it? The anointing. What kept Jesus healthy? The anointing. Yes, he took upon him our sickness, but he lived a healthy life. The anointing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't un un understand certain things in Scripture. There are men should, like Paul the Apostle, having an infirmity. We, you know, we, there's many controversies on what was it, and so on. But we have to stick with the Word. The Word makes it clear. The anointing gives you health. Amen. Through the Word of God, you can have health. Now, the three channels that God uses to release it on your life are the Scripture, prayer in the Spirit, and I want to emphasize in the Spirit, and worship. Now, I'm going to teach on each one of them separately. Because there's a lot in each. Now, when I talk about the Word, I'm going to explain that tonight. But I want to also say that the anointing is released through prayer in the Spirit. And that's the key here. Prayer in the flesh will not release anything. Prayer in the Spirit releases the anointing of God on your life and keeps it on your life if you stay connected properly and daily. And you stay connected properly and daily through communion with the Lord. But that communion has to be triggered. Private times with God produce constant times with God. You have to have privacy that triggers constant prayer. So the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Well, that's impossible until you have time alone. Time alone energizes you to have time daily with God. The price of neglect is very high. So we cannot neglect God. We cannot neglect time with Him. We cannot neglect time in His Word, nor can we neglect time worshiping Him. Now, I want you all to know, angels cannot receive the anointing because angels have no capacity to receive the anointing. No angel is anointed. Are they not ministering spirits? Their duty is to serve, and that's all, to serve for the church. No angel ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No angel will ever receive the anointing of God for service. But we, we need the anointing for service. They don't. They are created to serve. That's their duty. We are called to serve. And call means we have to answer for service. The angels 
are created to serve. We are called to serve. Big difference. If you're called, you have to answer the call. If angels don't answer, they are bound. They are re rebels then, and God will punish them for it, as he has already. One-third of the angels did not want to serve God. Now, the anointing of God first, and that's the way it comes first, it's through the, the Word of God. The Word of God is the engine that releases prayer. And prayer is the engine that releases worship. It is impossible to pray till the Word is in your life. And it's impossible to worship till prayer is in your life. So it, it, it begins with the Word, then prayer, then worship, not the other way around. If you don't know God through the Scripture... Because worship demands revelation truth. You cannot worship someone you don't know. Impossible to worship before you can worship him. How many understand? Say yes. yes. Now, let me keep going. We begin with the word. And so the Lord said, once my word abides in you, then you will ask. Then you will pray. That's John 15, 7. He said, if my word abides in you, then you'll ask. So prayer is the result of the word of God in your life and my life. So you and I make the decision. We decide to enter in. To You make the decision to enter. Now I'm going to tell you, you don't have to do a whole lot about prayer. Because the word will move you to pray. Yes. It's the entrance of thy word gives light. People can't praise because there's no word behind it pushing them in there. There's no power moving them in prayer. The word moves you to pray. That's why the word of God says, quicken me with thy word. The word moves you to pray. But you have to move yourself into the word. So it's like this. I move myself into the word. The word moves me into prayer. And prayer moves me into worship. Say, I move myself. I move into the Word. I make the first step. The Word moves me into prayer. And prayer moves me into worship. Now, isn't that simple? So you have to begin with the Word. Now, the Bible says... In Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19, that all power belongs to God, belongs to His Son, Jesus. The Bible also says in Luke 10, 19, that that authority or power is given to you. Acts 1, 8, He repeats it, it's given to you. So, in Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Jesus said, all power is given unto me. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. But then he says in Luke 10, 19, you can put that for us, please, on the, on the screen. Luke 10, 19. And you sweet people in your homes or on Periscope, Facebook, you can follow us, of course, and have your Bible with you. Just write the scriptures down, look them up later. But the Bible says what? I give unto you power. To tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any, by any means hurt you. So here we see that the power of God comes for authority. But the power of God then also gives service. That's uh, Acts 1.8. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you to be witnesses. So the power of Luke talks about authority while the power of Acts talks about service in ministry. So the power of God is for authority and service. Say that. It's for authority and service. Say it again. It's for authority and service. So that's why God gives it. To give us authority and then we might be able to serve. Now the Word of God clearly states that no authority 
can operate without faith. When circumstances, sometimes when circumstances don't change people, people become discouraged, people become defeated, people become unbelieving, and when these things happen in life, here's the danger. When faith is not in your life, you are literally giving authority to Satan over your life. I repeat, when faith is not in your life, you, uh, with that act of unbelief, give Satan authority over your life. Therefore, faith is what releases my authority. But we got to remember something. Authority begins with the word. Because authority comes from faith. And faith comes from the word. The Bible clearly states the word produces faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. But notice it says hearing and hearing. Meaning we're going to keep hearing it. You cannot receive faith unless the word is heard over and over means daily in your life if ever there's where it stops flowing faith will die and when faith dies authority dies so it says in the scripture faith overcomes the world faith gives us authority to overcome the world and all that's in it, including the devils running around. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, the word of God is very clear that when we live in unbelief, we give Satan authority. When we live in faith, we receive that authority. Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth, my father-in-law used to play piano for Smith, by the way, years ago. And Smith used to say, I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved but by what I feel. I am only moved but by what I believe. I am not moved by the things my eyes see or my ears hear. I am moved only but by the things I believe. Now, Mark 9, 23, we all should know that scripture by heart. All things are possible to him that what? Believes. But faith, faith is the gift of the Spirit. When we enter into the Word, when we bring ourselves into the Word, as the psalmist says, the entrance of thy Word gives light. When I make the step to come into the Word, at that moment the Holy Spirit imparts faith to my, to my life. That's in 2 Corinthians 4, 13. It says He's the spirit of faith. The Holy Spirit is the spirit that gives me faith. I cannot uh, uh, produce faith by confessing the word. Faith comes by the Holy Ghost. We having, this is 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken, we also believe and speak. Now, please understand this. All authority belongs to the Lord, but He cannot exercise it without a body. You are His body. All authority is His, but He can't use it without a body. You got to get that. Therefore, you are the vessel through whom that authority flows in heaven and on the earth. Now, hear this. Without you, the authority of Jesus is not working in heavenly places. 
Only through you is that authority active. That's why we are seated with him in heavenly places, releasing our authority. He is the one through whom, in whom that authority is, and it's our body he uses to flow. He, flo he flows through the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. How many understood what I said? Put your hands up high. Because he said, I give unto you all power to tread on and, and all the power of the enemy, including in heavenly places. Therefore, Jesus cannot exercise his authority over Satan without you. That is powerful. You have to surrender to him and let him use you. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That's the church. In Revelation 12, we see Michael the archangel in a battle, a great battle with the dragon. And it says they overcame when the church became involved. It's the church that has authority. Do you know how much authority you have? You have so much authority that by your words, angels are strengthened. And by your words, angels are weakened. That's in the Bible. That's in Psalm 103 verse 20. It says, angels excel in strength, hearkening to the voice of God's word. And God's word is spoken through the church. Every time you speak the word, angels become stronger. Every time you don't, you take away their strength. You strengthen them with your word. The word of God flowing through you is strength to the angelic. How many never thought about that? Put your hands up high. How many are glad I'm telling it to you? It's Psalm 103 verse 20. You read it for yourself. In fact, I think here, here, here it is. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength. Excel means they can get stronger or they can get weaker. That do his commandments... So they're not able to do his commandments unless somebody is speaking the word. That's why we're told what? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Because if you don't say it, they're not hearing it. And if they're not hearing it, they cannot do anything. Say wow one more time. Wow. That shows you the authority God has given you. That shows you his pleasure to let the church participate in his authority. Now, like I just said, the authority of Jesus, even though it belongs to him, he cannot exercise it without a body, without his church, without his body. And faith is not the product of reason. Faith is that force that's developed by the Word of God. Now, the Word of God that produces faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 35, 36, that we must have patience. So when we confess the promises, don't push God. Give Him time to use the Word through you. You hold on to His promise. Learn a secret. Never give up. You hold on to his promise and speak it out and never, ever give up. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who imparts faith spiritually, supernaturally. But once he imparts faith to us, speak it out. Don't keep it in. Let the devil hear the word out of your lips because that word will bind him. The Bible says, Jesus, hear this, 
He commanded spirits to come out by his word. The word had to be spoken before a miracle took place, even physically. Jesus did not heal the sick till he spoke the word of healing. The word had to be spoken. The Bible says what? He sent his word and healed them. The word has to be spoken. Now, please hear this. Jesus never cast a devil out with his thoughts. He cast him out with his word. Because demons cannot hear your thoughts. They can only hear your word. You've got to speak it. You've got to say, devil in Jesus' name, come out. I bind you in the name of the Lord. You've got to speak it. What does, the, what does the Bible say? No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue, that means demonic tongues, that will arise against you in judgment, you have to condemn. You have to say no. You have to say, I rebuke it. You have to say, I bind it. Or it doesn't happen. When somebody gives you a bad word, you have to break it. Otherwise, it'll happen. There's a lot of folks running around giving people bad words. God told me you're going to die tomorrow. Break it. With your mouth, break it. Don't break it by thinking it. Break it by talking it. You have to say, I break that. I break those words. I break and destroy those words in Jesus' name. Only then it'll break. But if you don't speak it, it'll happen. Because there's power in that tongue. Life and death are in that tongue. you got to speak it out. If I'm getting through to you, put your hand up high. Say it loud and clear. Say it loud and clear. All right. I'm giving it to you just like the Bible teaches. But now... Patience, uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 35, 36 says, Patience means don't give up. Don't give up confessing the promises. Don't give up holding on to the promises. Because now, as patience has that work of patience stays working in your life, now the Bible says that patience develops into an inheritance. That's all found in Hebrews 10, 35, 36. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Verse 36, please. For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. The inheritance comes after you have held on. Now, I want to show you how you can release God's power, God's divine energy that will operate in your life with all power that's yours. Is all power possible? Yes, yes, and yes. The anointing of God comes when the scriptures become rich in your life. That's what it, it, it means in Job 29.6. It says this, When I washed my steps with butter... The rock poured me out rivers of oil. So you got to walk in the word. You have to wash your walk in the scriptures. Let the scriptures control your life. Control everything. And you know what? Without the word, we dry up and then we, we, we begin fighting all sins. It's the word that keeps you free from the old life. It's the word that keeps you energized to fight demons. Because if the word of God is not in you and your Bible is collecting dust, those devils come back. Remember something. Demons always come back looking for vacancy. Demons don't give up on their old house. Matthew 12 says they come back looking if the house is available. So when a, when a demon is cast out... He goes through dry places looking for vacancy and comes back to his old neighborhood looking to see if you're still around and if you're still vacant. And if you're vacant, he goes and calls other devils 
to come and make your life worse. Vacancy is dangerous. So you need to put a sign over your life that says, no vacancy. <laughs> Let the devil know there's no vacancy. Let the word of God be so mighty in you. That's why it says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the word of God be so mighty in you that you that there'll be no place for the devil. And that's how we give no place to the devil. We give him no place by filling our life with the word of God. Read it every day. Meditate upon it every hour. Don't live a day without the Word of God. Look, now you have technology. You can put the Bible on your iPhone. Or whatever phone you have. Read it. If you can't read it while driving, it'll read for you. Just push the right button and let somebody read the Bible for you while you're, dri while you're sleeping, while you're in your home. Let the Word of God work. When I walk into my son's bedroom at night, I'm so thrilled because the Bible is on all night long. All night long. So I said to Josh, I said, Joshy, when did all this begin? He said, Daddy, he said, when I was younger, he said, I would hear noises. He said, demons would come to my room. He said, but they left when that Bible came, came, came on. Say amen. amen. He says, I leave that word running all night long so no devils will come in my room. <laughs> I thought, dear God, if, if, if a tape keeps demons out of a room, think what the word will do in your heart. It will keep devils out of your life. So do it tonight. Let the word begin working tonight. How, how do you say tonight in Spanish? Whatever. Let the word, let the word begin working tonight. In the car, put your, put the Bible on. It'll keep you away. I'll tell you what, it'll keep you safe on the road. The word has power. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, would you put Hebrews 4 for me, verse 12 through 14? I want to show you something powerful. We have got to understand how the anointing comes through the word. So it says... The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of son of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Are you all awake? Yes. Are you listening? Yes. I'm happy for you, and I'm glad you are. Now, please listen carefully, okay? The Bible makes it very clear. In fact, can we just, before we go on, can we read Hebrews 3, 7 and Hebrews 4, 11 together? Okay? Because this is really marvelous. In fact, you know, we, we do have the time here, so i got to read this for you. Let's begin with Hebrews 3, 7. Go right through Hebrews 4, 11. You'll, you'll see the whole picture. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, keep going, please. Every verse, harden not your heart as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Next verse, please. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works for years. Next verse, please. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do err, always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Next verse, please. I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Next verse, please. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Now watch for this. When the word is absent, when the word is absent, men and women walk away from God. When they don't want to hear it, they walk away from God, and the devil takes over. But exhort one another, that's what I'm doing tonight, daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Which means, when the Word of God is not in your life, sin gets in very rapidly. Keep going. For we are made partakers of Christ. Here it is. If we hold the beginning of our confidence, that means the Word of God has got to be in there. Steadfast to the end. Next verse, please. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation or mean testing. Keep going, please. 
For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Next verse. With whom was he grieved then forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Keep going. And to whom swear he that they will not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. Here he goes back to the word of God. If the word is not in your life, you are in serious trouble because faith will die. Keep going. We see that they could not enter because of unbelief. And unbelief is always a result of no word. Keep going. Next verse. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest... Any of you should come, should seem to come short of it. How powerful this is that do not allow anything to disrupt the flow of the Word of God coming into your life. Keep going. Next verse, please. Unto us then the gospel was preached as well as unto them. But the word preached to them did not profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith that is, is received by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God, the true Word of God, Releases the Holy Ghost. Unto us then the gospel was preached unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Next verse please. Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into his rest. As he said as I have sown in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And that's a powerful portion. I'll explain this in a second. But keep going to the next verse. For he spake in a certain place of, his, of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest on the seventh day. Keep going. Next verse. In this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Keep going, please. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they, do to, and they to whom it was first preached enter not because of unbelief. Next verse, please. Again, he limits a certain day in David, meaning in the Psalms. Today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you'll hear his voice, Watch how he continually repeats that we have to hear his voice. That means the word has got to be coming every day to us to keep us safe. Keep going, next verse. If Jesus had given them, meaning Joshua, by the way, is what it is meant in that precious name here, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day? Keep going. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. Next. He that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Next. Let's labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. And I'm bringing you to something powerful here. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Next. Now, here's the answer. The answer is how the word works. The word works in three different dimensions. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And then he enters into the physical realm, joints, marrow, a discernment of the thoughts, intents of the heart. We see three realms here. We see the spirit, soul, and body. Now, let me explain this. When, you, when, when we began, you, you need to go back and reread Hebrews 3, 7 and on because his whole point is this. Look at me, please, as, as I'm talking to you. His whole point is Israel failed because there was no transfer of the word from spirit to soul and from soul to body because there was no word in their spirit. They failed. You see, that, that, that that's powerful because they operated in the external and failed. Faith begins in the internal and flows out to the soulish and flows out into the physical and it begins to affect the world around us. Now hear me well. So he says the word is sharp. The word is powerful. Quick. Now let's go back and look at the words one by one. It's quick. 
powerful, sharp. Okay, let me explain now. This is very, very wonderful because in verse 11, can we go back to verse 11 very quickly, please? Hebrews 4, 11. What is it asking us to do? Labor. Say that. It's asking me to what? I have to work. I have to, I have to do something about it. What is my job then? Ah, very good question. It's quick, it's powerful, and it's sharp. Meaning, oh, you are really quiet now. The Bible first says that the word is swift. It moves from one world to another, from one realm to another very rapidly. The word is not slow. You are. You have to be as quick as the word. The word is quick. Psalm 147.15 says, His word runneth very swiftly. Are you learning anything tonight? Good. Say the word runs. The word runs. I, walk. I walk. Say it again. No, wait, wait. Say, say it again. Yeah. You can't walk unless the word runs. The engine is the word. And, and it's causing you to walk. But it's got to work inside of you. It's running very rapidly like a very fast engine. From spirit, soul to body, spirit, soul to body, spirit, and it keeps doing it. Like a train. But you are the ones that pour the fuel inside. So the Bible says the word is quick. Number two. And by the way, uh, that word quick means alive. That the word, there's life in it being produced on its own. It's dynamic. Uh, it's dunamis power. It's power producing more power. Comprende? Okay. But the Bible also says something about the, the Word of God. Now, whenever, whenever the Bible says, often it says me, it doesn't mean my body. Sometimes it does. It always means my spirit. So in, in Psalm 119, verse 93, David said, I will not forget thy precepts, for with them you have quickened me. You've quickened me. The word is swift. The word is alive. And the word quickens us. But it quickens us first in the spiritual realm. But I'm the one that has to receive it through my gate, my mind. I have to meditate in my soul to allow it enter into my spirit. When it gets into my spirit, it begins to charge the battery of my spirit, man. My spirit sucks it in with tremendous hunger. Because it's food to my spirit, man. Are you listening? Yes. <laughs> Siphons it quick. And the Bible speaks of the word has to be siphoned. He made him suck honey out of the rock. <laughs> I'm giving you secrets now, so hear on. Listen. My spirit man is like a hungry lion. Once I'm born again, it becomes alive and hungry, needing food for survival. The minute I begin to read the Bible, it begins to enter into my mental realm, mind. Meditation or, or repetition activates my soulish realm. That's why it's important to meditate on the Word. When I, and, and by the way, meditate means think about what you read. Go over it again mentally. Digest it there. Chew upon it is really what it means. No different than food in the, 
natural. Nobody swallows food. We all have to chew food. So when you receive it, like with a spoon, think about that's how it begins. Gets into your mind like a spoon into your mouth. But then you have to chew. Chew in the soulish realm is meditation. You repeat it to yourself. You chew it. I have to repeat the Bible to myself. I go over it and see what God is telling me. And now I activate the soulish. The soulish begins to feed the spirit. And food starts to drip into my spirit. And wow, it catches it. And starts to feed upon it. And now the engine starts to work within my inner being. Producing power in my life. And when that power gets to a certain level, that blessed word begins to come out of my mouth. It comes through my ears, down my soul, down my heart, out of my mouth. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks it. But the Bible says the word is first swift, it's alive. The minute, watch this, are you listening now? Yes. The minute the word is received in my, in my spirit, it's very important here. It comes in as logos, it goes out as rhema. It comes in as word, it comes out as a living word. And so as it pumps out, it begins to pump itself into my soul. So now the Bible says, the second, uh, keep, keep that blessed verse, Hebrews 4, 12. Don't take it off the screen. Please put it back. It says that the word of God not only is quick, it's also powerful. Powerful means it's moving rapidly in my spirit, producing more power in my spirit, man, and kicking it and kicking it into my soul with such power. Power moving in. And then it says, sharp. Now here's the thing that you and I need to understand. Oh, this is awesome. I want to just go back and, and because I want to show you how this works. Are you interested in that? Because yeah. that's how the anointing begins to flow out of my body. So now, remember what I said. It comes in as logos through my mind. I digest, mm, 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 my soul comes out of, gets into my spirit and starts to work generating power. It becomes, it turns into rema, into life giving. The dead letter becomes a living word. And now it starts to move out of, up my, and I just trying to help understand it, begins moving up my neck, my throat, and starts coming out of my mouth as a, a living word. Now, if I don't meditate, watch, watch, watch. If I don't meditate, I don't allow the word to go into my heart, producing life. Instead, it goes into my mind, comes out of my mouth. It's missing two-thirds. So it's, it's doing this, coming here and going there, and that produces death. It must go in to produce life. I'm going to get it. Put your hands up high. Doesn't it explain something here? So people read the Bible and speak it out, but there's no life. By stripes I'm healed, but they die. It's got to go into the spirit where the spirit of God is. Because the spirit of God is in the spirit, not the mind. The Holy Ghost is waiting for the word inside your spirit man. Because he's one with the spirit man. And he, the Holy Ghost, is the energy that connects himself to the word inside of you and turns the Logos word into Rema and starts to flow out of your mouth. Now, the Bible says in John 15, 7, if my word is in you, if my word is living in you, if my word is abiding means it's generating power continually in you, It'll even produce prayer. It produced such prayer that Jesus said, whatever you ask will be done. But also this, uh, the word is powerful. And the word powerful means energetic. 
it sets things in motion, it begins to achieve, is what it means. Are you all listening? This is where we begin to see Isaiah 55, 11 become reality. That the minute the Logos word enters through my mind, into my soul, into my spirit, connects with the Holy Ghost, becomes Rhema, at that moment, the promise is there. Where God says, so shall my word be that cometh out of your mouth, it shall not return void, it shall accomplish. Now we have results. We have results because it, 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 it came through the heart. Are you still listening? Yeah. How many are getting the whole thing real good? Put your hands up high. Say after me the word. The word. I, read it. I read it. My mind receives it. My, mind receives it. My, soul, meditates on it. My soul meditates on it. My spirit, My spirit. Receives, it now. receives it now. The Holy Spirit. Who is in my spirit, waiting for the word, receives the word, turns logos into rema, and rema comes out of my mouth and will accomplish mighty things for God. That's Isaiah 55 right there. Now, the Bible also says that that word not only is powerful producing and accomplishing results, it's also sharp. What does it mean to be sharp? It means it, it pierces soul from spirit and soul to the body. Um, I want to I wanna explain this to you. Say, I'm a spirit. I have, I have a soul. I live in a body. In body. Say, God, God is in my spirit. In my spirit. I, am in my soul, I am in my soul. And my soul is in my body. In my body. Want to say it again? Yeah. Say, God, God is in my spirit. In my spirit. Me, Me, I am in my soul. In my soul. Because see, you are the person. And the person is the soul. Comprende? Say now, my spirit and my soul are in my body. So it's, it's, it's like this. Makes it simple. Say, God is in the spirit. I am in the soul. And the soul is in the body. Simplicito. So the spirit of man which God created when he breathed, that's the habitation of God. My soul is the habitation of my personality, me. My body is the vessel where my spirit and soul live. And my body is the only part of me that one day will die. My spirit and soul live forever. And my spirit and soul are not a little ball floating in my tummy. My spirit and soul have face, eyes, hair, ears, neck, mouth, nose, full body. And my spirit and my soul, by the way, are alive, very, very expressive, because my person is there, the soul is there. And my spirit and soul can actually eat food, earthly food. Ha, 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 one day you'll, you'll see it happen to you. I don't want to confuse you, but I want to teach you. Now, when you were born again, the Lord quickened your spirit. The spirit that was dead became alive. That's what it says in Ephesians 2.10, we are quickened. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says that once you were quickened, you became one with the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is in your spirit, man. Uh, your spirit is the container in which the Holy Spirit of God lives. But your spirit and the Holy Ghost are one. There are not two of them. There's only one, and that's the Holy Ghost. Are you still listening? Yeah. Yeah. Your soul is the container of your spirit, 
and your, your body is the container of your soul. Shall I repeat those? Yeah. Say, my spirit, my spirit is the container, is the container of, the of the Holy Spirit. My soul, my soul is the container, the container of, my of my spirit. And my body, and my body is the container, the container of, my of my soul. Is that simple? Yes. Of course. Yes. Now the word... You like my accent, don't you? Yeah, thank you. The word pierces, the word is so sharp, it divides. Now, what does it mean it, it divides? It divides a, a roadway between my spirit, soul, and body. So now, when, when the word enters, oh, this is lovely. When the Word of God enters into your spirit, listen carefully, um, Jesus is born in your spirit at that moment. When the Word entered your spirit, Jesus was born in your spirit. He came into your spirit. When, when, when I say born, I mean there was a birth, there was a beginning. Jesus came in in fullness, he was not, he didn't come in as a baby in your spirit, of course. He came in and you were reborn. You became alive in him. Jesus came through the word. The Bible says we are born again by the word. Are you still, yeah. you understand what I'm talking about, right? Because I know it's, it's, it's a little deep, but you're getting it. If you are, put your hand up high. Wave at me. Okay. So, when I received the gospel... The Word of God entered as Logos in my mind, then it down to my soul and began to digest there, and then it got into my spirit, and at that moment, Jesus came in. But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm saying it in a way you can understand it. Jesus was born in my spirit, but now Jesus is, watch this, after that, he was formed in my soul. And once he's formed in my soul, he begins to operate in my body. Paul the Apostle used the word formed. Would you turn to Galatians 4.19, please? It's a very interesting word he uses. Till Christ be formed in you. Till Christ be formed. It's a process. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Now that's a powerful thing. It's a process. So when I receive the word, when I received the word, Jesus, if I can say Jesus was born in my spirit. Jesus came into my spirit. How many understand what I mean by Jesus was born in my spirit? It means he came into my spirit. Now, as, as I begin to activate the word through soul and body, Jesus begins to be formed in my soul and body. He's not formed in my spirit. He's born in my spirit. He came into my spirit in fullness. But he doesn't walk, he, he doesn't move into my soul in fullness. He moves in in process. I hope you didn't miss that. Yes. If, you did, if you did not miss it, put your hands and say, I got it. Yes. He came into my spirit in fullness, but my activity, my action, by meditating upon the Word and letting the Word enter my spirit and letting the Holy Spirit take hold of it and turn it into Rema, begins to form Christ in me. Literally, Jesus begins to form himself within my soul and then begins to manifest himself out of my physical body. You understand? Put your hands way up high. That is when the anointing flows. The anointing flows when Jesus begins to flow out of me. I think that's all you can handle tonight. How many had a good dinner? 
Can we give the Lord a mighty hand of praise for his word?